Super, thank you. Um, right. Uh, before I start on the presentation, um, I just wanted to just reflect on some of the things from the great speakers this morning, because we've, we're, I think we've been blessed with an awful lot of advanced technology. Um, and I think Eric said it in his last speech about there's a lot of stuff there. And I'm going to try and cover in the next half hour or so, operationalizing what's been said this morning and trying to clear out some of the fog of probably what we've heard and challenging ourselves as quality people to understand how that can move forward. Um, so to, this, to the speakers, my head's spinning. I've got lots of notes that I've taken in my little iPhone. I'm not sure how I'll get round to it all, but you know, just going on from things like MLST, serotyping, genotyping, whole genome typing, data, food industry 4.0, but I'm not sure what happened to one, two, and three. It, there's a lot of stuff today. Uh, an awful lot of stuff. So I'm going to try and cover that off if I can here. Um, so the only other thing I'd probably want to say is how uncomfortable I actually feel now talking to you around operationalizing quality. And the reason I feel uncomfortable is because you go home and challenge your own head about what you've just heard, and you start to say to yourself, am I actually doing that in my three dairies? Do they actually actually know that they're supposed to be doing that in these three dairies? Because we very much, as we said at the very beginning, with Claudia, we've got to make some money. We've got to make some money. So operationalizing what we've just heard, we might be what I call a self-licking lollipop by doing all these quality checks. But what value does that add to the line where value is created? And that's the operator touching the product at the right moment to ensure quality goes all the way through from the raw materials all the way to the end. So I feel uncomfortable because I'm not sure myself. I've challenged myself that much today. And great question from the lady from Danone. I don't know, wait, great question. We can probably deal with that afterwards because uh, sharing of skills and knowledge is probably one of the things my legacy really to the planet is starting up a, 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 a industry program for dairy in the United Kingdom that transcends companies. But you have to get over the fact that you're Muller or Arla or Danone. You have to get over that and see the common skill. So, um, as I said, I uh, work for uh, Muller Dairy. And in the United Kingdom, there are probably three uh, bits to the dairy. There's two main ones, and that's the milk side, which is Muller Milk and Ingredients. So that, in the old world, would have been Robert Wiseman plants and Dairy Crest plants, if you know the UK market. Um, I'm on the yogurts and dessert side. But Herr Muller started um, himself in, in 1971 there, where he took over from uh, his father, who'd uh, come from a, a line of family that started in 1894. So I think Frieslan Campino beats us there by, by 20 years. So, but it's a very family-orientated business. Indeed, Herr Muller is about 84 years old, and the hand of Herr Muller is still felt. So he reaches right inside the factories. And in fact, last week, he was talking to a butter operator on our plant through his interpreter because he wanted to know what was going on with the butter plant inside our factory. So it just shows you how family can extend in. But that gives us pride and a lot of focus. So, um, so there we go. Since um, uh, it was 18, sorry, 1971, Theo Muller took over his father's business in Arid Street. Just four people working there. Just four people. Nowadays, there's some key statistics. Just from four employees. I shan't read them. We have some latest acquisitions. So some from Friesland Campina, we bought three plants. And those figures are included there. So a lot of consolidation in the industry still going on. Now, the problem with that, and I guess Friesland Campina is the same, is that when you start to acquire, you give yourself a problem. <laughs> Certainly in quality, because every plant can do it better than the other plant. Every plant knows it better than the other plant. So when the uh, operational guys, the op OPEX people, I love the phrase OPEX, um, they want to try and standardize things, but somebody always knows it better somewhere else. So they sort of say, yes, we standardize, but we don't really, we do it our way, we carry on. So we're struggling still to standardize uh, across all our plants to make sure that we look at one system. It could be as simple as what milk uh, analyzer do we use. It could be as simple as that. Or it could be a procedure. 
what critical control points. But so acquisition doesn't make our life any easier, although it increases obviously the turnover and volume and profitability, profitability hopefully. So you can see our turnover there. Yeah, mainly in dairy, 5.6 billion there in, in euros. Uh, but we do do an awful lot in fish, deli, dressings and sauces, so which a lot of people don't know. So they associate Herr Muller with dairy, because that's where he started, but we've got quite a large business now, a lot of investment gone into uh, some of our German sites and uh, Polish sites, particularly on the fish side. Seems a bit of a dichotomy, fish to dairy, yeah, but it's there. Uh, but the growth area for us, though, is logistics, just transporting stuff around. Um, and that's, uh, you can see that 2.6 billion there, uh, and that's a growing area. Locations around the world then, so we're going to home now into where I am, that's where I'm going with this conversation. Um, we've got quite a lot of operations around the world, production sites and sales sites um, uh, around the whole world. And then in the United Kingdom, uh, we've got sites from Scotland all the way then down to Bridgewater in the south and across to London as well. So that's where we sit in the United Kingdom. Now, my bit of the empire, my bit of the empire is in the middle of uh, the UK. So those that know the UK, you've got Manchester and you've got Birmingham. We're sort of in the middle there in the sleepy county of Shropshire, with the capital city of Shrewsbury, um, if those that uh, know that battle between Shrewsbury and Shrewsbury. But anyway, um, so we're in the middle of England, and he chose that area for the first dairy, that's Market Drayton, because we've got free water there coming from a borehole, which is an interesting problem nowadays, and it's in the middle of, of one of the biggest milk fields in the United Kingdom, and it's on the west side of the country. So that's why we built it there. Now, in that area, I've got three factories. I've got Minsterly, built in 1936. Very traditional dairy, tiled floors, drains that could do better, roofs that perhaps shouldn't leak so much, uh, and so on. But a quite an old dairy, uh, but an, a very effective dairy. Really great product um, uh, coming out of there. And we do the Cadbury brand um, out, of that, out of that plant. We then got Telford. Uh, Telford was acquired by Herr Muller uh, about 10, 12 years ago from Nom Dairies. Nom Dairies being the Austrian company that did try and take on Herr Muller in his own market. Uh, and, and, and obviously, Herr Muller then bought the company, which was an interesting acquisition. That mainly does have private label. Um, and, and then in, in just north of there, then we've got Market Drayton, which is acutely taken as the, as the mothership uh, because it was the first one built back in the early 90s. So Market Drayton's capable of doing 30 million pots a week. Um, of pr principally corner, but there's Muller Light comes out of there, and also rice um, as well as a pH neutral. And then sits alongside um, sits alongside is, is Kalina, their main depot at Stafford. And I've talked about Kalina before now, um, and, and that is a huge operation. So we've got a little basket of stuff. It's an iconic brand in the United Kingdom. The Muller Corner and its launch took something like 45% of the market within about two to three years of, of opening its doors wasn't hard, because I'm not sure the Brits knew how to make yoghurt. Now, people would disagree with on that, but waste separation was quite a big thing until Herr Muller came along with the new technology and how to heat treat to the right temperature and hold it to the right temperature. So we have a basketball, and as I said earlier on, there's Kalina Group, and Kalina Group has been on an acquisition trail for the past uh, five or so years. Those that know the UK market, we've got Eddie Stubart in there, we've got Fowler Welsh in there. We've got people like um, Great Bear in there. These are huge companies in their own right, all now part of the cleaner group, which distributes. So he's vertical, very much so vertical. Uh, Herr Muller likes to control his own supply chain. So, right, that's, a, that's scene setting. So operational quality. So take into red now all our speakers this morning. And I'm going to try, try and make some sense in my head, but I don't think I'll succeed. I'll warn you that now because I've got too many notes about what I think I need to do with my team going forward if I want to digitalize. So, so define quality. And we'd all, if we had time, and I'm not gonna do this to you, but if we had time, well, I'd say, you know, who, who can define quality? What is quality in, in one factory compared to another factory? It's probably a bit here. You know, how, how passionate are you about quality? And probably more importantly than that is how quality is your operational manager, the manufacturing director. Because if they're not bought in, 
you're going to have a torrid time. You're not going to have an easy life if the production managers and the operational directors are not bought into quality. So there's a massive part in there for me on relationships. So we need some principles. Everybody needs a principle. Um, and you can see that in there, the, in the top left, where we've got relationship management. I, I'm, I'm a yellow in our, in our insights, so I, I, I like being involved with things. My next color is red, so I like to get things done. Am I a finisher completer? Probably not. Uh, my, my, my green is next, and then followed by close by my blue, which is that big, which is unusual for someone ahead of quality. But I've got three outstanding quality managers that deliver all that uh, color for me, because I spend most of my time trying to bring on board the operational side and make sure they understand what they produce could actually kill somebody or actually reduce sales because it's, it's not made in the right way, so quality side. So we have some principles. And then we come up against what, uh, you know, I dragged this off the internet, and, and what is quality? So there's two aspects to our job, I think. One, keep the food safe, top job. Don't matter what it's good quality or not, but keep it safe. Second bit is making sure that we meet these quality attributes, whether it's the right appearance, whether it's the right texture, flavor, and so on. So that's sort of what quality is about. Now you'd have your own, you'd have your own view on that. But once we get a quality definition ahead, we can then start to look at, okay, let's pick one product. This is Mississippi mud pie. This is something that you wouldn't necessarily want if you're on a um, uh, high sugar diet, because it's quite it's quite laced with sugar. Um, it's quite laced. But it, this was one of the products that all our customers said, you've got to bring it back. Because it got delisted, and then there was sort of like a uh, like a revolution out there, and our customer complaints department were getting all these these uh, things. We need Mississippi mud pie back in, so he bought it back in, um, and, and it's been a tremendous success. However, just pick it as a product. I think we heard off a previous speaker to understand your product. So we make something, and this something is about 40 days. Now that's unusual in the in the yogurt market we could actually go to 45 days. Having longer shelf life supports my supply chain. It makes sure that my minimum life on receipt is as low as possible because I know I've got a long shelf life on it. And I know it'll probably go to 45 days, probably 50 days knowing this, probably 60 days the way we, we, we do our sterilization and cleaning of lines. So we've got a product that will stay on the shelf as long as the supply chain needs it to. It's got a pH of less than 4.5, so we start the hurdle concept out there. We've got a well-packaged product, a well-heat-treated product that's got a great pH, lower than pH 4.5. We don't want it too low, not in the UK. It's a bit different to the German Muller. So the German Muller tends to be a bit more acid. We like it fat and sweet in the UK. We've always done that, and that's probably why we've got a problem in the UK with our weight. But anyway... Um, so we then go into the process, and I've just listed the process there. It's not necessarily in the correct order or not, but in there, as some of the previous speakers said, you've got to understand the process. Now, my quality team have got to understand that. I don't think they're good enough at that yet, but the quality team need to know and understand that process as well as the process operators so they can coach and advise. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. So we clean things. Yeah, we, we clean quite a lot of things, actually. Um, we heat sterilize everything at Market Drayton. So I've said Market Drayton now because the other two plants is a mixture. So Mincy tends to coal sterilize, and Telford is a mixture of heat and, and, uh, and coal sterilization. But we steam it. And if you walked into Market Drayton, you'd want to probably take some, a bathrobe and then put some water on the coal, because um, it can be quite steamy in there, which gives me another problem, because you then get an environmental problem, because you've got moisture in the atmosphere. So we mix things, we heat treat things, we prepare packaging lids and foils. A great debate about whether we actually disinfect the pots and disinfect the lids with this wonderful UV or photoelectric cells or, or hydrogen peroxide. Try that one out and see if your CRT testing actually works. My challenger, I don't think it does half the time. But anyway, um, so there's a, a, a challenge for me. We hold stuff, we cool, cool stuff, we incubate things, uh, we, we stick them in more tanks, we, we add some fruit in, another complexity, because we've got some yeast and mold being added into the stuff after we've heat treated, so we've got a yeast and mold issue. We fill at massive speeds. These machines need to keep running. 
Right? It'd be the same in the other big companies that are in the road. They need to keep moving. The moment we start doing changeovers, fruit changes just because marketing want to do a couple of different recipes on the day, it gives us complexity and gives the uh, quality team quite a lot of um, problems. We cool it and then we release the cleaner. Now this is where my story starts then, is on this release criteria. So the release to clean, the release to the logistics teams within the supply chain. So traditional testing would mean that I hold my stock for about 48 hours. So you see on the red there, 48 hour, uh, 48 hour hold. So we produce and hold it for 48 hours in our high bay warehouse, hold it for 48 hours. You're adding cost on now, yeah? Because I don't think we probably trusted our performance in our plants not to have a yeast or a mold problem. So we'd hold it. That gave me expense. It made sure my, my warehouses were full all the time when I wanted it out on the road. So it was important to look at some technology that could support us by reducing that hold time. I'm in phase two. I've got phase three to go. Phase three will be to release that product from the line. So Leppersdorf in Germany, the big, the big, big plant, are they released from line. So they're confident enough in their quality systems and their check-in and their control systems that it can release from line. I'm not there yet. And you'll see why in a minute. So at the moment, on traditional tests, we'd stick it into a warm room. I've got a picture of warm. Yeah, a warm room. Uh, we'd have hundreds of thousands of pots sitting on all these shelves. And somebody would go along them every morning and tap the lids just to see if there's any yeast out of there, which is the correct way. Still do it. It's what we do. Tap the lid. And if there's any domes or, or bombage, then we'd, we'd declare it either, either as a spoilage problem or as an accelerated shelf life issue. We'd do some other incubation support at different other temperatures. We'd do some extra micro. We'd do some pH. And importantly, we'd do taste panels. Either way, it gave me a 48-hour hold. So with improvements with the operation, that does mean a bit of coaching and learning. There's a lot more to this than just saying you've got an accelerated shelf life problem, you've got a spoilage problem. Can't leave it there. The quality team have got to be mixing in and around the operators, making sure that coaching, that close, close operation is happening at the line. So when I first opened up the talk about do we add value to the line, is yes, we do, but you've got to be at the line to do it. You can't be sat in the office or the lab doing whatever you do. It's got to be where the value is added. And I'm not sure we always get that point. So moving on then, um, using decount, and you've seen decount on the, um, on the, uh, the bench outside, those that are here yesterday. So from Biomayeur, we use decount. And that gets me down to about 27 hours release. And to be honest, I can release from line now but I don't release everything. Not everything is released straight away. But use of the Biomayer equipment, and that's why I'm interested in some of the other equipment, and I'll show you why in a minute. Together with the ASL, I'm reducing the amount of pots I've got in the ASL, so less pots in the, in the ASL accelerated shelf life room, uh, plus also the advanced testing, which is fine. So that gives our people confidence to release. And I've said that earlier on, it's about confidence. I think the lady from Dano there, uh, some of it comes from me about having the competency to be confident. The competency to be confident. Yeah, because a lot of people then say, if this works, yes it does. What did quality think? I'm not doing anything until quality sign that off. Or we'll hold it till quality come in in the morning. Or we'll, we'll, we'll no, we've got to ask quality. But they've got, because our, a lot of our operators and technicians probably haven't got that confidence to hold or release product themselves. So quality are quite important to the factory. The question is, should they be? Yes is the answer. But the operators is where the value is added. Those are the people that are making the decisions on a daily basis. So my objective, the third phase, and I'm working closely with Biomayer on this, to get to a point where I can confidently release 100% stock from line and never get it back. Because once you release 200 pallets of yogurt that's about to blow 
on Aldi shelves or, or Tesco shelves, you've got a big issue because they've got an image issue, obviously, in the retailer, and you've got a brand reputation issue going on. Okay? So to do that, we need to be organized. And the organization's changed to where it was 30 years ago when Market Drain was built, probably 15 years ago when Telford was built, and dare I say, 90 odd years since Min Mincely was built. The organization needs to adapt. And we've just heard in the last um, few hours about all this adaptive stuff, digitization, digitalization, which I'll explain in a minute, um, that is leading us now to be a bit more uncomfortable about what we're doing. So if you go into Market Drayton now, they'll be all plating. They'll, be, they'll get the pipettes out and they'll do the plates because they like doing plates. They put the plates in the incubator and the incubators come out and they do all the testing with the FOSS and they do all that sort of stuff. And they put it into a spreadsheet and it stays in the spreadsheet. So being organized doesn't necessarily with people, it's about being organized with equipment and the digital infrastructure behind that to allow decisions to be made, guess where? At the line. Maybe on some sort of app, I don't know. Maybe on an HMI, don't know. But at the line, rather than up in the lab where they probably don't know what the data is telling them anyway. They just know they've done the testing. So there needs to be some training. So back to my Danone lady. Um, we need to do some training, and it's absolutely right. So back in 2008, six dairies in the United came, Kingdom came together, including Isle of Foods, so I'm very close to Isle of Foods still. Uh, we maintain a relationship, a social relationship, to make sure that we get skills in the United Kingdom through a dairy training program. Perhaps we need to do that for a laboratory side, I don't know. But certainly we have to get over the pressures of being in individual companies, but training is critical. Next point I've got there is standards. Everybody's got to recheck their standards out there because that's what we work against, the standard, the specification, whatever that is. Is it pH 4.5? Well, if it isn't, what is it? What is the solids content in there? Am I measuring it right? Is it calibrated right? Are the labs accredited? All this sort of stuff. So we work to a standard. A lot of that standard, though, takes time to get out onto the shop floor where the value is added. And we can write some really complex standards and specifications. But do our operators know and understand what uh, AQS means or QAS means, whichever way you're around. We, we put AQS rather than QAS. But your quality attributes standards, specifications. And that leads to this confidence. You see that, I'll use that an awful lot. Because once you've got a system that's organized and trained, you're giving confidence out to people because the whole of the team work well together. Let's introduce my next slide, hopefully. The whole of the team work well together. So, how is it operationalized? Um, if I just go to the, th the fourth bullet point there. Uh, so, my other life, I've spent 38 years in the regular army and reserve army um, around the world doing different things. Uh, I've been away a lot more than I've been at home a lot of the time. But the one thing the military gets right, whether you love them or hate them, is that they work on one vision, they're all trained to the same standard, and they work on SOPs that everybody knows and understands. So when they go through a door, for whatever reason, they know what's happening on the other side of the door. Now in our own factories, where you get a recruitment challenge, and we spoke about that yesterday, because we're all getting older, we're all becoming consultants, <laughs> or, or, or we're all just going off to retire like Claudia at 50. But either way, we take experience out of the market. Once that experience is gone, it's gone. So the military, and this is a, a, the bottom right slide there, is a, is a, a military uh, doctrine. So we have doctrine in the military. And it's articulated everywhere how, how we behave and do things. And this is about operational leadership. And you can see words in there that are very similar to any of our factories. There's leadership mentioned in there. There's uh, people, there's uh, training, there's collective performance, all sorts of stuff, but it's the same thing. But we don't have chance to practice. So in the military, I'd say 97% of my time is training. In our factory, 97% of the time is delivery. Now, when are you going to train? How are you going to get people more confident? So efficient organization is top of my list. Um, where you lie with QA, QC, QI, QM, how all that rotates and fits together in well-organized processes, well-organized standards. Okay, 
And those standards then have to be socialized. And that's a new word coming from uh, a chap uh, who's my boss at the moment from uh, ex uh, Frontera and Friesland Campina. Very much on the, how do you get it down to the shop floor where the value is added to say what that standard is and what that quality expectation is. Otherwise, they'll just keep pressing the button, restarting the machine, keeping the same product going out without understanding what the actual standard is. Um, staff training and skills development we've done to death now. Regular audits and inspections, they still need to happen. People still, people say, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing these inspections. Well, sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to go and inspect that something is being done to the standard it should be done. Might not be regular, but it's got to be done still. People need to understand that there is a, an audit coming. So be it with BRC'd, with Tesco'd, and all those sort of things. They still inspect, call it what you may. Big on the list, though, is supplier co uh, collaboration. We're pushing down the chain, making sure we're working with our suppliers to make sure that the quality is right, becomes in the factory. I could swear at this point, but so if it's bad going in, it's going to come bad out the other end. I didn't swear then. There's a word you can use with an S. But you put it in the back, in the front, and it'll come out the back. It'll not change. It's got to be good. Um, uh, continuously improve in quality and with the operation. So I encourage all my teams to get involved with the operation. If they sit in the laboratory or in their offices, they will not be close enough to the operation to when they need to influence it, such as crisis. That relationship's not there. That relationship's got to be developed very much up front. Don't talk too technical. We've had that from somewhere uh, in the last uh, 12 hours or so. And the, la the, the, the last point for this slide is very much on the digitization and digitalization. There's two words there. Now, these slides will be available to all afterwards. I've put a, a YouTube link into what the difference is because I am massively passionate, and I'm a Royal Signals Officer, in the, in the army, so I know my IT, which upsets most of our IT in our organization, because I used to deploy it in a field easily. It's hard work in our plant that's been there for 30 years. The IT department seemed to be concentrating on the hardware, not the application. And we got rid of that problem 30 years ago in the military. It's about data manipulation. So if you don't understand your own IT landscape, that's what I call it, you need to get involved in it. That'll take time, because when Biomayeur talk about all this fancy stuff, unless you've got an IT plan behind that, it's not going to be easy enough to manipulate that data. Otherwise, you'll just have data going into a database. What do you do with the data? How do you get it to, guess where, the line? How do you get it to the line? Because if you can't get it to the line, you're not going to add value. What's the point of quality department? What's the point of spending hundreds of thousands of pounds of equipment that just checks stuff? So those that don't know, uh, digitization is converting data into digital format. So we're spending quite a bit of time at the moment, a bit frustratingly, converting all our SOPs and um, uh, factory standards into digital format, into SAP. Ooh. <laughs> into SAP. Uh, you try and retrieve it from SAP, great. But it goes into SAP, but it's digital. That's the point there. The next point is digitalization, and that's the use of hardware type things that allows you to access that digital information at the point of use. So there's a big difference there. Now, you need the IT department on point. You need to engage. So we're talking five years away from getting any sort of digitization plan in play because it's <coughs> got to go into our projects uh, software. It's got to have a number given to it and all this sort of stuff. So start early. You need to understand your IT landscape. So two more slides, then we're done. So this is where I'm going next. By, it sounds a long time, but I've just shown you, I think. Um, by 2025, I will have a plan in place for what I'm calling Lab 25. And that Lab 25 will be a plan that I'll work with uh, suppliers like Biomilieu, to have a digital quality space. Yeah? And that will mean that operators will have that data they need to add value to the line where value is added. And that's where we put yogurt in a pot or dessert in a pot. It's not in a server somewhere in Dublin, because I think well, most of our servers are in Dublin. Um, but it's 
a plan to make sure that all of it's interlinked. Okay, now go back to the very beginning. The problem I've got is we bought a lot. Probably like to know, probably like for you, Campina, we bought lots of different systems on different Siemens platforms, on different ages of, of internet cables, Ethernet 6, Ethernet 7, whatever they are. They're all different. So the handshakes between them have got to be spot on and right. So that's where I'm going, Lab 25, and it'll include a lot of digital technology because we've got to. And the point, I, th I don't know who mentioned it yesterday, I think it was, I think it was Sebastian, so, sorry, about age, about age, 0.7 I think it was. A lot of people are going, they're taking away their knowledge, and the only thing we're going to be left with is young people that are less interested and will move companies quicker every two or three years again rather than staying with a company. So that data has got to be retained somewhere and used in some sort of digital format. Simple, simple, simple. So I think the phrase there for me is embrace digital technology. And the trouble with not knowing digital technology, it's that fear of the unknown. So I'm standing in front of you saying, and I'm a digital officer in the core of signals, I'm actually feeling a bit uncomfortable, as I said earlier on, because it's not normal what we're about to do. Normally, we do plates. We do suck you up things into FOSS and it gives me a reading. We, we, we put things on an antibiotic thing, gives me a reading. I understand that. I can feel that. I can touch that. In this new world, we won't see much because it will be data inside, inside a computer somewhere. Anyway, thank you.